Aloha Hawaii, this is Paul Kalai Nui and you, li- you are listening to KWAI. This is Hawaiian Potpourri and I am, uh, oh, we are produced by the Hawaiian National Broadcast Corporation. We had been talking about some issues about the uh, Hawaiian sovereignty, the illegality of the overthrow and things like that. We'll continue with that subject and uh, if you'd like to call, our telephone number is 524 524- 1080. I know that we already have a caller. We'll go to the call right now. Aloha, caller. Welcome to the program. Hello, Polka. How are you today? Yes, fine. Aloha, Michael. Such a beautiful day. Yeah, it is. And and that last song was so pleasant. (laughs) Yes. I don't know the name of the last caller, but I am familiar with his voice and Mm -hmm. wanted to thank him for bringing to the forefront issues that are important to us all. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things I wanted to briefly kind of uh, build on is uh, the notion of uh, mental illness with uh, persons who seem to have such different views of reality Mm -hmm. that it makes Mm -hmm. one pause and scratch their head to wonder if there's something the matter with them. Be, be, I, I before you before you do, uh, I, I think uh, perhaps a wider audience should at least know that you have some uh, uh, what is that background in the field uh, as a psychologist. Is uh, and I hope you don't mind my uh, disclosing <laughs> that background. <laughs> No, and uh, to be more specific, Mm -hmm. um, my profession is a professional counselor Mm -hmm. uh, that focuses in on mental health issues. And um, uh, over 30 years, I have decided to direct my research endeavors to kind of analyzing the psychology of white persons, being a white person myself, to try to understand Mm -hmm. um, a deeper phenomena a psychic phenomena of why there is so much perpetuation of injustice, especially dealing with racial differences. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I'd invite the listeners and the last caller to consider has to do with the term that is referred to as defense mechanisms. Uh, Defense mechanisms are unconscious ways of thinking that affect how we make sense of the world and how we respond to the world. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with defense mechanisms is that they distort reality and therefore, depending upon the level of defense mechanisms that one is using, it can be classified in Western terms as a mental disorder. Mm -hmm. Uh, And what I have found in 30 years of researching white persons, especially as it has to do with white racism, is that um, there's a great deal of anxiety that is stimulated when conversations about race uh, are take place, whether it's in schools, universities, the workplaces, or during elections, things like that. And anxiety um, is the factor that we protect against by using defense mechanisms. Uh, I see. Three of the common defense mechanisms that I'm sure your audience and you are familiar with is one is called denial. One is called projection, and one is called rationalization. Mm-hmm. And as I listen to Mr. Coughlin and, uh, speak, it reminds me of many white persons who I have engaged in research with who really demonstrate how the defense mechanism of denial, simply denying mm-hmm. historical facts, that relate to the immoral and illegal takeover of the nation of Hawaii just are so embedded in one's thinking that it's difficult to provide factual information that one Mm. may even entertain. Mm. Uh, The second defense mechanism that I notice going on, and we all carry this polka Mm -hmm. to some degree, 
is rationalization. I'm going to give reason why, look, we went through a legitimate political process and Hawaii really is a state of the United States. Um, and the projection defense, that is uh, projecting blame, um, you know, it gets manifested by white people saying, you know, Polka is a nice guy, but um, he's really off base on this and he's not using historical facts and we really are part of the United States. So rather than discuss how mental illness may be affecting white persons who continue to support the notion that Hawaii is really a state of the United States, I would encourage us all to consider how these defense mechanisms, mm -hmm. mechanisms that we all use at different points in time in our lives, really underlie the schism, the barriers that mm -hmm. we experience in trying to deal with a reasonable consensus about historical facts. So um, I, I appreciate your saying that you don't think Mr. Conklin and other white people that we've encountered are mentally ill, but I wanted to kind of point out uh, in order to help clarify and perhaps mm -hmm. give greater understanding how frustrated we can be with individuals who either deny reality, project blame on victims of reality, or rationalize injustices out of need to maintain superior and dominant in, in mm. our society. Mm -hmm. And I'll just take your comments off the air, but I wanted to okay. add those two cents. Good. Thank you very much for elaborating on, on this subject. And uh, anyone else who would like to call and share uh, a view of this? And uh, I, I think if you look back, not necessarily only with the subject matter of Hawaii and what I think is a clarity in the case, especially with the uh, more recent uh, apology resolution, which was a second resolution that the first caller uh, had raised and, and in a discussion with uh, Esther Kia Aina and the validity of that resolution. Now, in terms of that resolution, I believe that that resolution was valid in that it did not, within the domestic laws of the United States, it did not contradict uh, the power of the Congress in terms of reserved powers to only one body of the Congress, uh, such as the Senate. It did not contradict the treaty uh, limitations of uh, the Congress by a joint resolution of Congress. So I think that one uh, was appropriate. It had validity. Uh, so it would be a statement of, uh, and it would be the law of the land um, in, in terms of uh, domestic law. But there are other things if we don't want to look at something so closely associated with our emotions to analyze what uh, uh, Michael had just called and, and shared with us. You can take a look at the subject matter of slavery and how for a long period of time you still had this group of folks who uh, denied the inhumanity of slavery because they weren't really human beings. They weren't white people. They didn't, didn't believe in Christ. Uh, and I, I remember one back in 1970, no, 19, when was that? 69, when I went over and, uh, you know, I was admitted to law school in, uh, at George Washington University. And so I traveled to Washington, D.C. and uh, stayed in a home uh, on the outskirts in, uh, what was that, New Jersey? And uh, stayed with uh, a man uh, who, you know, sort of roomed in, in that house. And he was very adamant that, uh, and he was... Uh, he claimed he was a doctor of, uh, he had a doctorate degree in psychology as well. 
And they say, you know, those black folks, uh, I talk with them often and I ask them, um, who are you, your heroes? And can you identify a, a African who was an inventor or who was a famous scientist, etc., etc.? And that was his test in order to keep that race oppressed or suppressed uh, and that was his way of keeping them uh, or validating I guess the whole concept of the the superiority of, of the whites uh, prior to that back in the 1800s of course uh, they use the same argument and the fact that they were not Christians, etc. For a time, uh, they also denied the uh, uh, right of, not the right, the very existence of the Chinese as being humans because, and there was a very uh, well publicized case out of Texas where the court, uh, when uh, the judge was to hear a murder case of a Chinese, uh, a coolie, uh, worker in the railroads, I think it was, and the judge said, uh, you have proven the case that uh, this Chinese person was killed by the defendant. However, you cannot charge or you, you have not proven the case that he is guilty of murder because he did not murder a human being. Uh, this person, by definition, by being Chinese, was not a human being. Uh, so you will, they will use that uh, religion or uh, racism or some other basis of in, even denying the right of these groups to fall within the category of the equality of all human beings. Uh, but that's a mindset, and that grows out of uh, long years of, of thinking, and that becomes part of the so-called culture itself. And uh, I think it was William, no, not William Penn, who was this other guy, uh, uh, who wrote that book, Common Sense, uh, Tom Paine, was it? Yeah. And uh, he said something about uh, the customary thinking is oftentimes even more difficult to overcome than uh, logic. I, I forget how he put it. I've used his quote in some of my writings on Hawaiian sovereignty. But this idea of customary thinking that of course the, the earth revolves around or the, the sun revolves around the earth and of course the, the earth is uh, flat and of course and of course and all of these customary thinkings whether it comes from the church in that case, the only church that had existed in their minds was, of course, a Catholic church. And uh, so when Galileo uh, came up with new scientific findings, uh, he was excommunicated. And, and, and that is part of the, I guess, in terms of the larger society where people run into customary thinking and uh, the people within the establishment for whom that customary thinking supports, such as the federal as well as state judges, <laughs> all with their cloak. <laughs> The cloak was supposed to uh, be a sign of protecting them from evil forces, I guess, or some extraneous uh, uh, bewitching eye to protect them from uh, other, other ways of affecting their decision. And the only thing that should affect them is, is logic. Uh, but uh, I think sometimes a cloak is to stop them from uh, being impressed by the realities and so all they are made to do is continue with the customary thinking, uh, the acceptable thinking of the society that continues them in these positions. And for all of that, uh, uh, 
what, what I continually mention is what I learned in uh, science. Uh, I, th I think it was uh, Professor Bernadowitz and some of you who went to the University of Hawaii and had your introductory uh, class in science uh, learned of, uh, from uh, Professor Bernadowitz uh, in the history of science from a very, very early time as Western science began developing. Uh, and he quoted Plato, and that was, you need to save the appearances. You can come up with whatever theories you want, but you need to save the appearances. In other words, you need to be able to explain the observable facts. So, uh, another way of putting it in more uh, political democratic form is yes you are entitled to your own opinions but you are not entitled to your own facts you cannot say I refuse to accept those facts because my op then it won't uh, accord with my opinion therefore I'm gonna have to change the facts <laughs> to accord with my opinion <laughs> so Bernadowitz and Plato would say no 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 that's not how it works if the theory does not meet the appearance, the, the facts, uh, then you don't try to change the facts, you change the theoretical model. <laughs> so you cannot change the fact of American invasion into Hawaii. You know, it's historically uh, recorded. You cannot change the fact that the vast majority of the people of Hawaii did not support the overthrow of Liliuokalani, did not support the actions of the United States, did not support the cession of Hawaii to the United States, etc., etc., etc. And the historical record, because it's so replete with that information, not only the Kuei petition, but even before that, when uh, it was suggested that uh, President uh, Harrison Benjamin Harrison, when he heard about the takeover, takeover of Hawaii and the cession of Hawaii to the United States by, at that time, the provisional government, he was very excited. He says, oh, this is great because uh, now we can expand beyond the, the, what is that, the continental limits. We can begin our movement into the Pacific. So good, let's immediately hold a plebiscite among the people, have the vote taken, and then in incorporate Hawaii within the United States. And then uh, his advisor says, uh, well, we need to go easy on that plebiscite because the people themselves really do not support what has taken place and the cession of Hawaii into the United States. So he held back or he kicked back and uh, he did not go ahead and proceed with the movement for uh, uh, for accepting Hawaii or proceeding with the treaty other than sending it to the Senate and then it was left there so by January uh, he had already been uh, directed that he would not be the president for the next four years Cleveland was to be the president so he left the treaty in the US Senate for discussion and when Cleveland came in in March he then sent the investigator to Hawaii to uh, confirm this finding and so in the blunt report it, it blunt says almost to the man the people of Hawaii do not support the provisional government Okay, and then of course you, you do have the Kuei petition which is even more evidence of this fact. So what happened to the, the will of the people? Completely overshadowed by the interest of the US government, Minister Stevens, and uh, uh, the people who had been called the missionary boys who then converted themselves into the Committee for Public Safety and the, person, the, the committee who went and asked the American Minister Plenipotentiary to land the American troops to protect American lives and property. 
of course, when he was asked, or they were asked, whose lives and, and property, they said, our lives, because we are American citizens. <laughs> so on one hand, they pretend that they are Hawaiians and they should govern the land, but when they need the protection, they run to the American minister and says, land them to protect our lives and property. Uh, so it's that step-by-step -step transaction. So they converted themselves to the uh, Committee for Public Safety, and from there they then converted themselves to the uh, provisional government. They declared themselves in existence on the 18th of January. No, I think it was the 17th of January, 1893. And on the 18th of January, they sent emissaries to the United States, uh, prohibited Lili Okalani from sending any of her emissaries on that only ship that would send sailed from Hawaii to, the, to uh, the United States and then carried with them the uh, Treaty of Annexation already signed and ready for adoption. So within, in less than a month, in February, the treaty arrived in Washington, D.C. It was signed by uh, President Harrison and this is what I spoke about earlier and then it was uh, submitted to the U.S. Uh, Senate. My time is up. Fuck.